sort of thing that Ox would have done, which is like a dialogue between a couple of characters. Um, so this is a creative piece too. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this is really like it's not about the about the plays. It's oh, really okay. to try and get okay. a story from from someone okay. and see if how if we can adapt it into a sort of monologue or. Uh, tell us about an experience you have communicating with a person of a different generation than you and the significance of that moment for you. It can be any situation. Um, well, one situation that would that comes to mind immediately was the conversation I had with my mother. Uh, my mother had me when she was 30 years old, so let me just give you some background. My mother was born in 1920, and she passed in 1990. I was born in 1950. Right? So that's a 30-year but one of the conversations we had was uh, one where I had shown her a listing of famous African Americans that had been given to uh, students at my high school, John W. Hallahan, Catholic Girls High School, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, <laughs> right? Like you know, which trees. Uh, as a result of a march on the school district of Philadelphia on Friday, November 17, 1967. I was a senior in high school at the time. And uh, the march was on the 17th. All kinds of negative things happened, but the purpose of that march, as I recall, was uh, students were concerned that there were not enough black teachers, there was not uh, black history, and there could have been some other you know, pieces to that. And so, here I am in this Catholic high school, majority white Catholic high school, Hearing the roar of the crowd, and I think we were locked in for a while, and then, you know, went home. But that Monday, and I have since had an opportunity to talk to some of my high school friends, because we all were in the same class. So I don't know if I was in a history class, religion class, or English class, but I remember getting a one-pager that said, Famous Negro Americans. So I took it home and showed my mother, and uh, she uh, began to sort of rail in terms of what... You don't know who Benjamin Davis is? What do you mean? You're like, I'm like, oh, you sent me to what? You sent me to the nuns? <laughs> no. We talk about intergenerational pieces. Um, I always think of I go home first, you know, because those are wonderful, you know, wonderful stories, you know, that I have um, from my mother. And can I tell one more? <laughs> yeah. Okay. The other one is um, my grandfather came to live with us after my grandma passed, and that was 1960. And grandpa would. You know, he was he would sort of walk around with his cane and we had a little store at the corner and he and the other elders would go and sit for a while, come back home. So sometimes grandpa out of nowhere would take his cane, bang it on the floor and start yelling, God damn. They put Lucy on that block. Now I was about 14, 15, and I'm sitting there thinking, Grandpa's got that wrong because I remember some of the names in the family, even at that age, but if he's talking about Lucy as in descendant, it couldn't have been his sister on the block because Grandpa was born in 1880 and she was born a little bit after that, so he's got it all wrong. Well, come to find out at a reunion in 2000, 2000 something, I forget. forget. My, cousin, my cousin said, I'm telling the story, he says, Jack, he wasn't talking about his sister, he was saying. He was talking about his aunt, he was saying. Because Grandpa, my grandfather was born in 1880. His father was born 1835. So the point is that Papa Isaac Brown had a sister named Lucinda who was put on the block. And so, so Grandpa knew exactly what he was talking about. But smarty behind over here, <laughs> trying to think I'd get it all right, and I had it all wrong. Mm -hmm. But these are the stories that I carry with me. These are the stories that I tell uh, when given the opportunity, especially to young people. Because once, and this is maybe sort of recent, I think it was 2008 or nine. I was at a high school and one of the students said, well, what did happen in those 60s? This one, no. We heard it was like rocking and rolling and it was more than that, it was hooking and jabbing <laughs> as well. So it's, it, I think it's good to tell stories. And as, you, and as a teacher, when you go and speak to other people about teaching children, teaching youth and so forth, storytelling is a critical piece to mm -hmm. it, as long as it can be authentic. So can you share a story of a time when you had to think about whether or not to speak up in a work or community or a neighborhood setting? Um, and like in that regards, like whether you were kind of, if you had a kind of inward, um, uh, what is, a, an inward fight with yourself about whether or not you should speak up. 
Hmm. It happens, um, I'm trying to think of that instance as opposed to my maturing and becoming more assertive. I mean, I, you can't shut me up. <laughs> um, I'm really going to have to think about that one in terms of when was there. Oh, yes, I, yes, one just hit me. <laughs> 11th grade, 11th grade history at John W. Howe High Catholic High School, where Sister Odilla said something about, they were happy slaves. How can I forget that? So that must have been 1966, 67, something like that. Because I graduated in 68, so we were years sort of crossover. And Ursula, I can't think of Ursula's last name, but she stood up and she said something in response to that. And Odilla just kept going on about the happy slaves. And I wanted to say something, but I didn't know what to say. And I was scared, you know, to say anything. And then comes senior year, when April 4th, 1968, Dr. King is assassinated. Before we can graduate in June, Robert Kennedy is assassinated. And as I tell my students when I was in eighth grade, Robert Kennedy's brother was assassinated. So all these deaths. So when I begin to think about it, when Sister Odella said what she said, and you just posed the question, I was trying to go back in time, I was how could I forget that? Was that cowardice? Was that fear? I think it was a combination of everything, but I think the, the hard part was not knowing what to say. Knowing that you want to say something, but how do I hit back? And so a part of my decision to become who I've become is to figure out language to hit back. Um, for example, this past uh, Thursday, but there was a meeting around the Eastern State Penitentiary, which is a, a huge attraction here in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Al Capone was there, Willie Sutton, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to have, meaning Eastern State Penitentiary is going to have an exhibit on mass incarceration. And there was an early meeting, and folks were very clear, at least uh, with the group that met at the Church of the Advocate, because this group was meeting with uh, different groups all over the city. We were very clear about what's your intent, and I remember posing that question. So I'm past the point of fear now. Of course, I'm 65 now. But I'm past the point of fear in terms of what is, what is it you're really trying to get at by having this exhibit? So uh, one of the folks, Sean Kelly, he was sort of, I used the term tap dancing around it, is not really responding to my question. But the other person who was the researcher said, well, we really like to have those who go through the exhibit, who are mostly white, middle class, you know, uh, Americans, to have some empathy. I said, are you serious? So I said it then, and then I said it this past Thursday again. I had to say it again. I said, and I said, I'm not about any empathy for white folks around something that they created and don't deal with. So how does Jackie Williams move from fear, not knowing what to say, perhaps cowardice? I could have said, I tried to, what could I have said when I was in 11th grade? What could I have said? I don't know what I could have said. But I didn't say anything. And, and I think that through the years when things have happened, you know, to me, and I mean to me just personally with respect to race and unfairness, or maybe it wasn't, maybe I didn't look at it thoroughly. Um, how did you become who you are now? I think that, um, once again, home plays a critical piece because my, my mother, once again, was, was a force to be reckoned with, you know. Uh, she said to, to my sister and me, when she left the South, she said, damn the South. But she sent us back many summers. Uh, she would push her way to get us on that Greyhound bus. <laughs> you could have been third or fifth or twelfth. Somehow we got up there first. Get on that bus and you go and find your roots. <laughs> and so for me, I think that the piece around when was I afraid to speak up has dissipated some. I think there are other instances where things happen. I, I have some recent things that have happened where I might pause now, but then I'm just getting ready. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and then there is the pow. And as I had... Uh, my friends say, well, if you keep doing that, people are going to listen to us. I don't really care. I'm just at a point right now where there is enough 
there, there's enough that is going awry that if you don't have the language to respond, you're going to have to do something. You just can't sit. And that's what August Wilson, I think, was, was doing by, by talking to people. Let me hear what, what's on people's minds. And now how can I make it so that people can learn from those experiences? The responsibility of black people themselves to educate themselves or is it the responsibility of society and the system? Well, I would like just to make a distinction with respect to, as we use the term, black community, because I don't see us as a community. I see us as, as people living in neighborhoods or in areas, because a community means you have some power to control certain things in your community. So I think we use the term in wanting that collective to happen, but I just don't think, particularly in this town, that it happens necessarily in that way. There are some areas and neighborhoods where you have that. Now, with respect to the second part, you know, whose responsibility and who's, a, who's accountable, um, the history of this country is responsibility of every citizen, and it, should, and it should be a situation where the authentic truth of how this country came about as this William Pitt, the great holy experiment, the way in which it has, you know, evolved and emerged. But it falls short and shy of that in terms of accountability. Because as someone said, when we talk about black history or American history, it's mandatory. If you talk about African American history, it's, it's an elective. Mm -hmm. Seriously? No. You don't have America or the Americas without the labor of the African. And you cannot separate that as when you begin to read some of the rationales for the perpetuation, continuation of enslavement. Well, we're not talking about, you know, the soul of the person, which of the person's labor. You can't separate those two things. They come together. It's a human being. So how black folks are viewed as human beings, is that our responsibility? Uh, yes and no. I mean, the reality would be, I'm a human being. I should be treated as a human being. But that's not been our story here. There has been a relentless assault on African American people. So let me just take you to this meeting on Thursday. So as they're getting at what do you want this exhibit to do, I said, well, I'd like for the exhibit to reach white women who, as women, are primary caretakers of children, as are many you know, women, whether you have personal children or not, it's, it's the female people. But as primary caretakers of children, what are you doing to end this racism? Because we end that, you knock that sucker out, <laughs> other stuff is going to fall into place. But there's no movement to do that. It's almost as if, um, well, I'll think about it. <laughs> that doesn't help the situation. So whose responsibility it is this entire country's responsibility to treat people according to what the credo says? If you believe that all people are created equal, then, then make it real. America is yet to really come to grips with that. It makes exceptions. And there should be no exceptions. It's not when it's your turn. <laughs> You know, no, it's not about it. it. should be, are you ready? Are you prepared? Let's move. But that's not happening. It's not happening in, in oh so many ways. Education, housing, employment, and all this. And, and it's hard for me to say any more than that because I'm 65. And there was a point where I thought there's going to be great strides. I would say that was maybe in my 20s. And then it has just lessened and lessened. And I wonder about other generations where they thought, maybe it would be better for my kids. And the answer is no. There's been, there's been some movement, yes. But I would give that a 5%. 95%? we got to get with it. Different, different issues and concerns. I'm finding, I'm so, finding many, so many different mentalities different mentality today. It hard. seems hard. It seems challenging. It seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard, 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 hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything, everything else is a else challenge. Is a challenge. Else is a challenge. challenge. Um, um, so, 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 I'm ready for, I'm this, ready challenge. for this challenge. And I was built, and I was for, this. built for this. I